Hello, everyone, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Better the Pond podcast, the Flying V edition, where we talk to incredible people who are creating impact and ripples on the pond. My name is Warren Berry, and I'm your host and the founder of Instinctive Solutions, where we believe that everyone is an odd duck, but that's what makes them awesome. Now, today, my guest is Martin Sosha. From his very early beginnings in Warsaw, Poland, Martin's parents risked everything and came across the pond in 1972. Today, my guest is Martin Sosha. From his very early beginnings in Warsaw, Poland, Martin's parents risked everything and came across the border in 1972, then crossed the pond to establish a new life in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Martin learned about hardship, struggle, hard work, but in turn developed a very large heart to support everyone around him. Most of Martin's professional career has been around the oil and gas industry, which is typically about money, grit, and time. Martin sees it differently. For him, it is about how we care, we empower people, and improve lives. Oh, and we also do oil and gas. He says that life is 10% what happens to us and 90% of how we respond. Thank you, Martin, for how you respond because it with great clarity that this is how you better the pond. Get to know Martin, and you'll know what I mean. Ladies and gentlemen, Martin Socha. All right, so Martin Socha from the SharePoint Group, uh, through our previous discussion, uh, this is your very, very first podcast, being on the world's only Better the Pond podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. Thanks, Warren. It's a pleasure to be here. So before we jump into all the questions here, Martin, um, you know, just tell us a little bit or tell my, my listeners a little bit about SharePoint. Tell us about, a little bit about what you do, what SharePoint does. Kind of give us the, the overview of uh, what goes on in your world. In my world, okay. Um, well, let, let me start here uh, by maybe chatting about myself, right? Just to give you a little bit of a background and how I ended up at SharePoint Group, or do you want oh, me to go? Oh, no, no. We're going to get into your backstory yet. That's what I talk oh, about. Oh, we are. Okay. What, what SharePoint, what SharePoint does. does. All right. I got gotcha. you. Okay. So SharePoint, we're an energy service provider. Uh, we do uh, um, industrial constru construction work. We basically got four pillars of our business. We do electrical instrumentation. We do compression services. And then we also have a rental fleet. We've got 11 branches located throughout Western Canada and two in the U.S. We're an employee-owned company that puts people before profit. And, um, and uh, we're very proud of, of what we put together here. So um, we've grown tremendously in the last year, Warren. I know you've been following our story. Uh, we've added 150 people to our team um, in 2022. We've opened up five new branches. And uh, we're poised for exponential growth. And uh, it's a pretty incredible place to work. You know, it might be a little bit biased when I say that. Um, but we've got a wonderful leader in Trevor Muir. We've got amazing colleagues and teammates and, and friends that work here. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it's, we're really excited. You know, we're trying to build an organization and a company that's going to last for 100 years to come. And uh, it's pretty incredible to be at the beginning of that journey, you know, and setting it up for, for later on. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you did already give a shout out, which I was going to do as well, but we'll shout him out twice. So Trevor Muir, right, who's the CEO, uh, who I had on a previous podcast, um, he's a, an exceptional human being, which is and really making incredible things happen at SharePoint for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, he's the reason I'm, I work here, you know, so and why I've stayed for so many years. And uh, he's a really dear friend. And uh, he's an incredible person to be around with and to work with. And uh, and uh, yeah, I'm just really proud, proud to work with them. So, and before I jump in, this, I just have to say this, um, you know, I, I work with a lot of organizations. I, I talk to a lot of CEOs. I'm, I'm working up clients in Canada and the U S and, and you know what, and you know, especially in the oil and gas industry, I'm just going to go there. Uh, and my son's in there. So I have some, some knowledge, but you know, you're an organization, which amazes me because I mean, even talking to Trevor, like there is no problem with you guys saying that you love each other. Yeah. And, and it's so, it, it just, it amazed, I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed. The fact is you care enough for each other as people um, that you say, uh, we love each other. And, you know, which, and especially in the oil and gas industry of the big burly rigor type that we typically stereotype that we typically see. 
Um, and I think it's remarkable that, you know, it's you, you put people first and business second. Take care of the people and the people will take care of the business. Right, Warren? That's that's the biggest thing. And we spend so much time, you know, at work. We spend most of our lives at work. So you should care about the people that you work with and you should have love and empathy for them. And you should, you know, have a purpose when you come in every single day. Otherwise, if you don't, you know, that's when mental health comes into play. You become depressed, you become unhappy, and then it seeps out into a lot of other aspects in your life. So it's really important for us. I mean, we've got two things that we really concentrate on outside of the business, right? We concentrate on our five core values, and then we concentrate on our core purpose. And our core purpose are, is three things at SurePoint Group. Number one, we care. Number two, we empower people. And number three, we improve lives. And you and I have had a conversation before. You know, we, we follow those core purposes and the byproduct of our business is providing, you know, electrical instrumentation, compression services. But, you know, we exist, you know, because of that core purpose. And that's and that's and that's really important to us. So, yeah, it's, I, I think it's really unique. You know, I look at a lot of different companies in our space. Number one, I don't see any company that's employee owned. Um, and um, and I'd like to think that we do things a little bit differently around here, you know, when it comes to, you know, how we care for each other and how we care about our communities and how we care about, you know, the planet in general. So it's it's pretty cool. Yeah. And I'm going to say this and I'll say it at the end as well. But, you know, uh, follow Martin and we'll get that we'll get all the the logistics at the end of this. Right. But sure. follow you and follow Trevor and SurePoint um, on social media, uh, especially on LinkedIn, because what you what you will find is they they will not talk about oil and gas but they'll talk about people and um, empowerment and positivity and all those pieces that go along with it so i'm just going to throw that out there because i think it's you're, you're somebody to follow and you have a very very compelling and inspiring message awesome thanks warren so martin what got you from being a gosling and i'm not I'm, I'm not here we go and I, I have to i have to say this I'm talking about like where you were hatched. I'm talking about the Gosling, your 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 very beginnings, Martin. Yeah. Wow. Right? So what you got for being a Gosling to leaving the nest with the time yeah. that you decided to you had to get out and head on your own. Your parents either you either you left the nest or you got kicked out one of the two. Um, and to where you are today. So Martin Socho, where what is your backstory? Yeah, the origin story. It's uh it's a long one. I guess everybody has a long one. Um, but my story started out 1979 in Warsaw, Poland. Warsaw, so, Poland. Yeah, that's where I was born. I'm I'm Polish. My my uh, that's where my family is. 95% of my family still lives in Poland. So I was born in 1979, and at that time, Poland was a communist country, right? And it was a difficult place to live. Um, my parents at that time, uh, right around I was two years old, three years old, they decided they wanted a better life for themselves. And it was a difficult place to leave, to, to leave right? So um, you would, if you tried to leave, you'd be thrown into jail, right? If family members knew that you were leaving, I mean, they'd probably tell the police, otherwise they'd be thrown into jail too. But my parents wanted a better life for themselves. They didn't see a good future in Poland. So in 1982, they jumped into a car and then at midnight, they drove and they went through the border and they landed in Austria. Now, they lived in Austria for about six months. You know, they had a variety of different jobs and then they had a choice. They had a choice to move to three different cities. One was Toronto, one was Calgary, and the other one is Sydney, Australia. And still, when it's minus 40 in beautiful Calgary, Alberta, you know, I always go to my mom. I'm like, why didn't we move to Sydney, Australia? You know, <laughs> what, what was she thinking? <laughs> what was she exactly? <laughs> but you know what? But Calgary was all over the news at the time. You know, oil and gas was was a huge industry. Um, they've heard that Calgary was a great place to live. They had some friends that already came here. So it just made sense. And so in 1982, we moved to Calgary, and then I was uh, raised here ever since. And uh, it's been home. It's uh, a city that I love and that I adore. You know, it's a city that's very resilient. We've gone through tremendous peaks and valleys over here. But I got to say, and I might be a little bit biased when I say this, it is one of the friendliest cities you'd ever go to. You know, it's a big city with a small town feel. 
whenever we have, you know, international guests coming from various parts of the planet, they're blown away by the kindness and compassion and friendliness that this city has to offer. So I grew up here, you know, I went to elementary, I went to high school. Uh, once I graduated high school, I actually went to SAIT. And um, my dad was a computer programmer. So I thought I wanted to be a computer programmer. And I went to the SAIT and I did computer engineering technology at the time. And I graduated in 2000, right when Y2K was blowing up. And uh, I couldn't find a job, you know, and uh, the only job I could find was working like at a Best Buy or a future shop and doing like IT repairs. But I had to use my car. I had to drive to other people's houses. The pay was minimal. And then I started doing some programming work and I realized I didn't like programming. I'm like, I, I just I didn't like it. So so I went back and, and I focused on instrumentation. And uh, I really loved instrumentation. And for people that don't know what instrumentation is, it's when you look at a plant or a facility, you have all these different little devices that measure flow and temperature and pressure and, and, and level and, and so on. And all these devices tie together and they go back to like a, a brain or a, or, or, or a main system, right? And instrumentation is tying all these devices together and making sure that that brain is operating properly. So I love that part of it. You know, and I could still use some of my programming knowledge because it was a little bit applicable. And then I worked, started working at a surface oil production company called Maluni Industries um, at about in 2000 or 2001. I worked on the instrumentation team and uh, we were building surface oil production units uh, in the shop. So heater treaters, desalters, glycol units, basically big process equipment that was treating oil and gas. At that time, I had an opportunity to uh, not only work in the shop, but uh, I got to join a, the commissioning team and we were doing lots of work overseas in Russia. So I put my hand up and I joined the commissioning team and all of a sudden I found myself in Siberia, you know, starting up oil and gas equipment in the middle of the Arctic, um, you know, minus 60, minus 70 was, was common, you know, over there. I remember the first day I, I flew over there, Warren, and I'm, I'm flying with this other electrician that was from one of their companies. It was called Burmac at the time. And they were later purchased out by ABB. But when we were going to Siberia, I mean, we flew from Calgary. Then we went to Frankfurt, from Frankfurt to Moscow. Moscow is this massive city with five airports. You know, so you land at one airport, it takes you three hours to drive to the other airport. And then we fly another eight hours into, uh, into the middle of Siberia. And I'm flying there and I'm sitting next to next to my buddy, Mark, and uh, and he's putting on a second pair of snow pants and he's putting on another jacket. And I'm like, what are you doing, man? And he's like, it's cold outside. I'm like, I know it's cold outside, you dummy. We're from Canada. Of course, it's cold outside. <laughs> and he's like, no, it's cold outside. And I really didn't know what he meant until we landed, you know, so we land in the middle of Siberia. It's this icy kind of a runway. I don't even think they had a road underneath it. And we get outside and not only was it cold, but it was humid. So that humidity just pierced you like, like a knife. And, uh, and, and I ended up working there for a number of years. It was, uh, it was a wonderful experience. You know, some people would say nah, it was tough, um, but, but it was great. You know, I, I, I learned a lot about myself. I worked on 30, 60, 90 day shifts, you know, on these camps in the middle of nowhere, I got a chance to, to learn how to speak a little bit of Russian. I got to experience some of that Russian culture, which is really neat because I have a Polish background. Yeah. So it kind of brought me back to my roots a little bit. And, uh, and then sometimes I'd come back to Canada on my days off. Sometimes I would stay in Europe and I would bomb around. And it was a really instrumental part for me in my life. It was really, really cool. And I made good money too while I was doing it early in my 20s. Yeah. So I saved enough money to, to pay off my student loans. And then I saved enough money to, you know, uh, save up for my first down payment on my condo. And so I came back and I was doing it for about four years. And, you know, you miss out on certain things in life as well. But but it was well worth it, in my opinion. And uh, about four years after doing it, our company got bought out by uh, by a compression company out of the U.S. called Hanover. And. Our company was amazing there. And this was my first lesson in culture. Um, you know, we used to celebrate everything and you knew everybody in the shop and you celebrated milestones and you hung out with each other and everybody came in, you know, with a purpose and they were happy. When we got bought by Hanover, you know, uh, we were treated, and I hate to use this analogy, but like the redheaded stepchild, 
Mm. You know, yep. so now you must use these tools, you know, then you have to do things this way. And we became a profit center for Hanover and uh, the culture changed. It was and it almost changed overnight, you know, that that caring about people disappeared. And I remember we had 84 employees. And I think in that first year of that takeover, um, 60 some quit every week. Every week they had somebody oh. going away, somebody leaving. And I remember driving to uh, to this red brick building every morning. And uh, as soon as I saw it, it, it gave me anxiety. It gave me, it like took my mood from, you know, a natural eight or a nine down to a three, knowing that I was going into this environment and I was really unhappy. And uh, one of the biggest things that, that happened to me over there, which was, you know, an instrumental part of, of my journey was uh, I was walking through the shop one day and uh, there was a guy by the name of Bob, right? And Bob was a welder. He worked there for 30 some years. One of the nicest people that you'd ever meet and walking through the shop and uh, and uh, Bob's no longer there. And uh, I go to one of the friends I was working with. I'm like, where's Bob? And they, they let Bob go. And nothing like, no, thank you. No pen, no cake. And I'm like, that's wrong. You know, like for a person that has devoted that much of his time, that much of his life into his craft, into his company, to see him leave without anything was just like so critically wrong for me that I decided that I wanted to, to, to leave as well. And, and that's why I wanted to try something a little bit different. So I started figuring out what I wanted to do. And uh, I had a few friends come up to me and they said, you talk a lot. And I said, <laughs> yeah, I talk a lot. I talk a lot. And they said, you should get into sales. So I started looking at different sales jobs. You know, I couldn't find a sales job because I needed sales experience to get into that sales job, right? So I needed somebody to give me a chance. And luckily through a few friends, I got referred to a rep agency in Alberta called Broadwell Industrial Sales. And I think I started with Broadwell in 2004. And we were a manufacturer's rep agency for a lot of electrical instrumentation and automation parts. What was really helpful for me at that time was because I had my technical background and I worked out in the field. Now I'm talking to engineers, I'm talking to tradespeople that are using these components, but I can talk to them because of my background and, and my technical knowledge, which was really good. Right. So I started working at Broadwell for about six to seven years. Uh, it was a great journey, good company, good culture. Um, and then it felt like I um, eventually kind of, you know, had a ceiling over there. And I was approached by a German automation company called Phoenix Contact. And Phoenix Contact, based, uh, based out of Germany, a uh, big automation company, think of Siemens. Um, and they were looking for somebody to, uh, to work in Alberta. And, um, and I went through a series of interviews. I knew the team over there because we represented Phoenix. And then I worked at Phoenix for three years. Eventually, they promoted me to Western uh, Regional Manager for Western Canada. So I was responsible for Manitoba to Vancouver uh, or BC, ran the sales team, and it was a wonderful job. We had great products, good people working with us. I enjoyed the traveling. I loved going to Germany, you know, eating the bratwursts and uh, drinking German beer, which is wonderful. Um, and, and it was a really cool job. And I was single at the time, so the traveling didn't bother me at all. Um my last year at Phoenix, um, one of the biggest things that we did there is we gathered all of our clients from Canada and we took them over to, uh, to a trade show called the Hanover Fair. And the Hanover Fair is probably the biggest trade show in the world. And uh, when you think about it in context, you know, have you ever been down to the Global Petroleum Show in Calgary? I it's have like big, not, but I've heard about it. It's, 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 a big, it's probably the biggest show that we have here, Warren. That show in Hanover, compared to the petroleum show in Calgary, I think it's called the energy show right now, to be politically correct. Um, but but it would be like a sandbox next to Disneyland. Like, there's no comparison. This show in Hanover is absolutely massive. There are 33 buildings. You have to map out what you want to see because you're not going to see it all. And then our company had the second largest booth there, and the booth was um, 34,000 square feet. A oh. booth, a trade show booth. What? 34,000 square foot booth. Yes. Three stories. The first floor was all the new products that were coming out each year. 
And then you had like all the different R and D people, the technical specialists, so they could start talking about the products. Escalators in this booth, boardrooms on the second level for meetings, and then they had a top floor with a restaurant that overlooked the trade show, where you could get some of that great German beer and pretzels and brats and all that good food. So it was really, really neat. And uh, Siemens actually has the biggest booth there. They're about forty thousand square feet, and then there's a couple companies that compete for second. But anyways. So we gather all these people from Canada, right, from west to east. And uh, I ended up, you know, meeting a man by the name of Trevor Muir. And I'm like, Trev, you got to come with me to the show. And so he ended up coming and he brought one of his automation specialists. His name was Nick. And they come out to the show and Trev and I hit it off and, you know, became friends. And, you know, uh, it, it was great. It was just a natural fit. I loved him as a human being. And and we got to really know each other, you know, by spending that much time together and traveling and eating and going and seeing all these different things. And I came back and uh, didn't really think much of it. Uh, of it. And a couple of weeks later, Trevor calls me and he goes, uh, I need you to come and join me at SharePoint Group. And uh, I was flattered, flattered, but I really liked my job. And I'm like, hey, no, thanks. Really flattering. I'm happy over here. And I said, no. A couple of months later, it goes by and same phone call. He's like, I want you to come over here. And I'm like, no, no, listen, I, I love my job over here. You know, I just want to be friends. And then I think a couple of weeks after that, he ended up driving down to Calgary and he said, I'm not taking no for an answer. You got to be on the team. <laughs> so <laughs> we ended up chatting and uh, you know what? I really loved uh, Trevor's vision. I mean, I already really enjoyed him as a human being. I loved the culture aspects and I also wanted to get into a bigger sale because when I was working at Phoenix, we sold components, right? Mm -hmm. And the big allure for me, you know, moving on to, to my career, the next step was how do I sell big projects, mm -hmm. you know, where all those components go into, whether it's a big building for power distribution or power generation or construction project. And I thought it was going to be really neat. And uh, I decided to, to leave Phoenix almost nine years ago. My, my, uh, my anniversary is on Valentine's Day, believe it or not. That was my first day at SharePoint. So I still wait for flowers and chocolates from Trev, you know. Nothing? <laughs> no, nothing yet. Nothing. Ho hopefully he listens to this podcast, Warren, and maybe I'll get some next year. So just like he sort of basically you were voluntold to come join the Sure Group. We're going to mm -hmm. fall and told Trevor to listen to the podcast to make sure that he gets this. We'll, we'll highlight this little section right here. That There we go. Yeah, we'll absolutely. Appreciate that. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So nine years ago, you know, almost in February, I joined SharePoint Group. I uh, When I got here, I didn't know what I was getting myself into, to be honest. It, uh, the company was struggling at the time. Um we were on the edge of forbearance, you know, which was very difficult. It was 2014. We were in a valley in Alberta. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people cared about the company. And it was owned by private equity at the time. And uh, it was difficult, you know. And Trevor had a really, really difficult job, too. He was the glue holding everything together. He was new in a CEO role. Um, you know, we didn't have that much work. And then when I started, um, you know, I came from being a golden child in my previous employer to being somebody that a lot of people didn't want to associate with because they, I, I think a lot of people felt I was an unnecessary cost. And, and what I mean by that is SharePoint was struggling and they were making some really tough decisions. We had to lay certain people off in different areas. And all of a sudden, you know, Trevor comes down to Calgary and hires this new person on the BD team. And it's like, why did we just hire this person when we're struggling in all these other areas and we're letting our friends and our family go, right? Mm -hmm. So I got here and uh, and uh, I, I questioned why I came, but like I do anything in life, you know, if I made a decision, I stick with it and I got to figure it out. And I just put my head down and I started to get to work. You know, I said, you know what, the only way people are going to like me and if they're going to see value in me, if, if I actually help and I contribute. And uh, I started selling and, uh, you know, started doing some really good stuff in our equipment packaging division where we do big buildings for power generation and distribution. And that kind of became my niche over the next few years. And uh, we went through a lot of ups and downs, you know, at SharePoint Group. So, yeah. And here you are. There's your backstory. So just a couple of quick questions. Um, only child? 
You didn't talk about your siblings? Oh, only, only child. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So there was there was there was not much to pack when they when your parents decided to uh, cross the border. One suitcase in one hand and baby me in the other one. <laughs> yeah. Um. So uh, what? This this question was not on the podcast, but what what do you think the greatest because of your background? What was the greatest lesson that your mother taught you? The greatest lesson my mother taught me was I don't think she was trying to teach me a lesson. And when, what I mean by that is uh, it was tough. It was tough as an immigrant coming to Canada in the early 80s. You know, uh, she had to learn the language. She didn't have a really good relationship with my father, to be completely transparent. My parents ended up splitting up and divorcing when I was in grade six, which was very difficult on our family. Mm -hmm. um, my mom never asked for anything. So she was a very, very hard worker, the kindest person you'd ever need. Um, you know, she'd give her shirt off the back. And we always had people and friends coming over for meals. And I mean, she could barely feed us. But mm -hmm. I remember in, uh, in grade six or grade seven, uh, this is a, a key moment in my life. Um, she was working two jobs and then she was uh, coming home at night and then she was cooking, making sure I had a good meal. And then she would lock her, she'd go to her bedroom and she'd lock the door and she would start crying. And she would start crying because she didn't know how she was going to pay for the bills next week. Mm -hmm. She didn't know how she was going to pay for the next meal. She didn't know like how she's going to pay for schooling and all the things that I needed as a kid. And that hit me like a ton of bricks when I was 12 years old. And at that time, you're in this impressionable age where, you know, your friends are getting Nintendos or they're getting a Sega Genesis or they're getting Michael Air Jordans. And there was no way on this planet that I could go and ask my mom for this stuff because she was really struggling. And that day at 12 years old, I made a commitment to myself. I said, I will never see anybody in my family suffer the way that my mom is because that is a product of output, right? Mm -hmm. I can work hard. And if I work hard, I can generate money and I will take care of my mom. I will take care of myself. I will take care of my family later on in life. And um, so I started up um, a lawn mowing company with a buddy, you know, at 12 years old, we got an old lawn mower from a neighbor, you know, three houses the first year we quickly grew to, you know, 10, 15, 20 houses. And that was my first job, you know, kind of as an entrepreneur. And then also with the value of, of, of buying things, you know, I, I couldn't just put something on a credit card and, and I couldn't just ask my mom for something. So when I was saving up for that Nintendo and I really wanted one more, I'll tell mm -hmm. you what, I really wanted that Nintendo and play those games with my friends. Well, you know what? I had to mow a lot of lawns. And by the time I saved up enough money, I looked at that Nintendo. I'm like, do I really want it? Is it worth it? <laughs> and I ended up buying it because I really wanted it. Okay. Right? <laughs> But, but that was the value. So it's not something that my mom necessarily tried to teach me. It was, she taught me because of the environment that we were in. And it taught me that you have to work hard in life. And if you do work hard in life, then you get rewarded for it. At the same time, it, it, it did the inverse for me. And it created me a, a, into an, a workaholic at right. a certain point as well, which is a different story altogether. And it led to some other stuff in life that I had to overcome. Sure. Attaboy. Um, thank you for that. Uh, what yeah. about your dad? What, what did your dad teach you? Uh, yeah. We know the world word uh, role models, right? Yeah. So, so people that we aspire to, um, to be like, um, my dad wasn't that. Okay. <laughs> so my dad was, um, was an anti-model. Okay. So, and um, he, he was um, self-absorbed, I would say. It was uh, all about him. He was very smart. Um, but he wasn't very involved in my life, to be honest. And then when my parents split up, he completely disappeared and he got out of the picture. So my dad actually helped me um, become a better father for, for my son because he wasn't there for me. Mm -hmm. You know, he wasn't present. You and I chatted about that before we started the podcast. Um, he was very cynical. He was very negative. He would uh, put me down lots. All those things that he did to me, I do the inverse of for my own son. You know, I'm supportive for him. I make sure that I'm home for dinner every single day. 
I'm making sure that I put my phone away. So I'm with my wife and I'm with my son. I take him to his little sports, you know, um, activities. I hang out with him. And then I support him and I encourage him in so many different ways because I never got that from my father, you know, and I look at it and I'm like, if I did have, you know, what I'm giving my son, if my dad did that to me, how much further ahead would I be, you know, without this learning? So I try to use that as motivation. This is an anti-model. These are all the things that he did, you know, the bad qualities that I don't want to follow. And then I do the opposite of. So that's what my dad taught me. So he taught you, and so I'm sure that he, he he taught you how to be supportive. I guess so, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what he taught you. Just, yes, just in his way. And I guess so, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Cool. Thank you for that. So my next question to you, Martin, is um, what's the biggest or the greatest thing that's ever happened to you that's ruffled your feathers? That has really ruffled your feathers, and and how did you respond to it? Uh, something that's really ruffled my feathers. Um, it's been a while, you know, I, I've, I've, so it's a, a hard one to answer for, for me, Warren. I, I, I think right now I, I, I don't get ruffled too much. I've really concentrated on controlling negative emotions in life. Um, I guess maybe um, one thing that ruffled my feathers or things that ruffle my feathers, I guess, I guess it's people that are negative, right? That point out problems, you know, they never come up with solutions, people that don't take ownership in their own lives that blame everything, every, everybody else for, for their own things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think that that does, that still kind of ruffles my feathers, I guess. Right. Um, but but why I'm having a hard time with this question is because there's that old saying, you know, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. So even though there's lots of people that will intentionally try to ruffle your, your feathers in life, um, we all have, um, it's our responsibility to you how you react to every situation. Mm -hmm. And I try not to get my, my feathers ruffled too much these days. You know, you stay calm, you stay positive. And um, you don't um, worry about the things that you can't control. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Yeah. That's sage advice right there. So now we talked earlier, Martin, and I said that, you know, geese fly 71% further and faster. So 71% more efficiently when flying in the V formation than when flying alone. So what do you think from your experience and then even we can work at SharePoint, what do you think the secret is to getting people or getting a team to fly in that V formation? They have to believe in a greater purpose than themselves, you know, otherwise they're going to be flying by themselves. Right. So that's the big thing. Like, what is our vision? What is our purpose? Where is this company going? And then really communicating that down, you know, from Trevor to, you know, their next level of leadership and so on and so on. Um, so it's really communicating and believing in it and not only saying it, Warren, you know, it's uh, but doing it. Right. So. So that's a that's that's a that's a big thing for us. So and we have to build a healthy organization and, and you follow us lots and you know how much we care about community mm -hmm. and you know how much we try to give back. Um, but in order for, and, and our number one core value and core purpose at SharePoint Group is we care. And sometimes this gets mistranslated with, with our people, you know, and with, you know, external people as well. They think sometimes it's a little fluffy. You know, we care mm -hmm. about our community. We do all these things. You know, we participated in the Festival of Trees up in Grand Prairie. You know, we're doing, we're doing all these things with food banks and uh, we're hosting barbecues and, uh, and that type of stuff. And that's all great. And that is a showcase in that we care. But we care also translates to other aspects of our business. We care, number one, about our business. So we have to maintain and run a very healthy organization. We have to run a profitable organization. We have to make some tough decisions sometimes. We have to hold each other accountable as well. So we care is, number one, we care about our company. And then if our company is in good shape, then we can care about everything else, you know? I, I, this isn't a sure point thing. This is a, this is a me thing. And you can see me on, vi on this video and you follow me on LinkedIn. Yeah. 
I started making this hat a couple years ago, right? Through COVID, I was going through some really tough time. And one day I just started scribbling some stuff and three words popped into my head, self, family, community. So you can't take care of your community if your family's a mess and you sure can't take care of your family if you're a mess. Mm -hmm. So take care of yourself first, then take care of your family. If you've got anything else left, you know, take care of your community. And that's your job, your community, anything external. And it's kind of like that um, airplane thing. When the mask pops out, whose mask do you put on first? You put on your own, right? And then right. you put it on to your neighbors. So, so the we care aspect at SharePoint Group, no different, right? We got to care about our company first before we can, can care about anything else outside of it. But uh, it's really important to us. But we share that vision with our employees. And uh, we're also employee owned. So two uh, year year and a half about a year ago we rolled out our first employee share ownership program. So similar to to WestJet, right? Mm -hmm. So anybody in our company can participate, and you can contribute one to ten percent of your paycheck. You know, all the way from an admin to a senior project manager, and then you can purchase SharePoint shares. Um, the cool thing is, if people stay with us, you know, for a year, then we have a 20% matching contribution. Oh. And, you know, as we continue to evolve and our company grows, our share price is going up. So it's a wonderful thing. And uh, we did this for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, you know, if we do well, let's not be, you know, at the party by ourselves at New Year's, you know, <laughs> popping the baby duck or the bottle of champagne. Like, <laughs> yeah. Let's do it with the greater group, right? And it'll be way more fun. Number two, um, okay, we needed something that was going to attract people in our industry. We needed something that was going to retain people in our industry because we have this very transient workforce where, mm -hmm. you know, people will come and work with us for a project and then they'll jump to another company because they're going to get paid a couple extra bucks an hour. Correct. Yeah. So, and then also, how do we get people to care about this business more? And I remember watching or flying with WestJet in the early 2000s and you got on that flight and you knew there was something different about this mm -hmm. company, yep. you know? You were greeted with this genuine smile. You were greeted with this amazing, exceptional service. I remember watching these clever little commercials they had on TV about employee ownership. And it was no different for us. You know, I kind of equated to when you go on holidays, how do you drive that rental car versus you driving your car at home? Right. You know, <laughs> you hit a pothole with the rental car. Oh, well, no big deal. It's not mine. I'm going to go return it. When you hit your own car, oh my God, like... Why did I hit that? And you make sure you don't hit that pothole again. Right? right. Yeah. And then you take care of your car. So the employee share ownership program, having employee owners uh, coupled with the we care aspects of our company, that's really our guiding light, you know, and that's why we really want to build a company that's going to be around, you know, for hopefully a hundred years to come long after I'm gone and you're gone and all of our listeners probably, who knows? So <laughs> who knows? Um, that, that's really interesting. Um, I, I love that concept of, of, you know, being employee owned. And one of the questions that I ask organizations a lot, when I go in, one of the first questions I ask is, especially like not so much to the leadership team, uh, but right into the staff, because they're the ones that are, that are sitting underneath getting, you know, whatever the message is. And I, I, I clearly ask them, you know, do you have a job or do you have a purpose? Mm -hmm. And if they say they have a job, then we're in trouble. Yeah, and we need to we need to we need to change that. Um, if everyone says we have a purpose, okay, now what is the purpose? And are you clear? Has it been clearly defined? And do you know? You know, are you flying in that V formation towards that that golden pond? But it's an interesting question, right? So it sounds to me what you're trying to achieve and getting please, you know people flying the V formation is that everyone not only you've got ownership, but everyone is you're your purpose driven company that just happens to do oil and gas. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a moral obligation for us to pursue things that are meaningful in life, you know? Mm -hmm. And if, if you don't, I mean, that's, that's when you find yourself in an unhappy state. And, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, uh, side little story. So I, last year I took my son to, uh, the Telus spark. It's a science center here. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we go in there and they have this digital, it's called, it was called the human experience. It's one of those digital immersion tours where you go through all these different rooms, right? And the premise of that experience was to see how you evolve as a human being from, from when you're hatched, you know, <laughs> there you go. 
Very good. To, 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 when you, to when you die. And uh, and walking through these chambers, and I'm going to the third chamber, and they have this big picture or video of a baby laughing. And uh, it says the average baby laughs 300 times a day. And then they have a picture of an adult male. And it says the average male laughs 17 times a day. And I left there, and it, it's there was lots of stuff in there that thing's still like permanently ingrained into me and it hit me like a ton of bricks i'm like what happens <laughs> so what happens where you have a, a you know a 20x down and laughing throughout the day right mm -hmm. and I, I came home and i started scribbling on my whiteboard i'm like well people end up in jobs that they don't like people end up in relationships that they don't like people end up in bodies that they don't like and then people feel like they're stuck like there's nothing that they can do about it Right. And so I wrote down three, three questions on my whiteboard that helped me every single day. Right. And it's like, who am I? I could ask myself who I, who I am. Right. Number two, who do I want to be? And number three, what am I doing to get there? Mm. So just even thinking about those three questions every day helped find that purpose in life. And with SharePoint group uh, with us, uh, purpose is, is the most important thing for all of us. I'm just making a note here. Yeah, I love it. Um, that's really interesting. They ask yourself those questions every day. Um, fascinating. I'm going to be a good steward of time. I'm going to try to keep us moving forward here. So, mm -hmm. and I want to get into, you know, what I want to get into a little bit, because it was one of the things that really got me with Trevor, that really got my attention. I mean, he's got a great backstory, but um, when we look at SharePoint and yourself in it, because I've also, again, watched your videos, um, what are you, what are you doing right now, Martin, to, to better the pond or what is SurePoint doing to better the pond and what, what ripples do you think that you guys are creating out there? Uh, you know, not only concentrating on our own company and then, you know, uh, helping out in community, the one big thing for us, and this is really, really important is, uh, promoting the trades, Warren. And, you know, we've recently gone through a pandemic on this planet, you know, there's another pandemic that nobody's talking about, and it's a pandemic of the shortage of skilled trade workers in our country. So, I mean, as we continue to grow and all of our competitors continue to grow right now, there is a scarcity of manpower everywhere, right? And uh, we started doing a bit of a deeper dive into this area, trying to understand where, where everybody went, how come there's a shortage? And uh, I'll give you a really alarming statistic for, for every, and this is all skilled trades people, right? So plumbers, mechanics, instrument techs, like you name it. Mm -hmm. For every seven to eight that are retiring today, only one new person is going into trade school. Only one. And the average age of an electrician is probably the mid 40s. A plumber is probably around 50. So you have these people that are going to be retiring over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. We have less people going into school. There is a massive gap. And we live in this world that is becoming electrified, right? We've got buildings. We've got HVAC. We've got bridges. We've got lights. We've got everything. Like every, all these pieces need skilled trade workers to operate. So we can, we can build them. We can maintain them. We can fix them, right? but there is a massive shortage. And when we went to the root of the problem, we're like, well, ha, ha, why did this happen? Well, we've been conditioned and you and I talked about education earlier on, right? That, you know, when, when you go through life, you should go to post-secondary education. You should get a degree. How many people that you know in life that went and did a degree in philosophy or did a degree in language arts or this or that, and they're working at a Starbucks or they're working at a job that is completely irrelevant to what they graduated from. Mm -hmm. And they came out of that school with a tremendous amount of debt that they'll probably never pay off. Right. Right. Yeah. And so what happened, people that couldn't go into those universities, then the community college and the skilled trade work, they just kind of fell into it. And then there was this bad stigma that if you can't make it over here, then you just kind of fall into this area. So our big important job right now as an organization, you know, um, is to promote skilled trades, you know, and we do career fairs. We're going to high schools right now. We're promoting it through social media as well. But how do we encourage young people to get into trades, you know, because we need tradespeople 
and the world needs them to be a better place to operate. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where we're really trying to better the pond on that side, okay. because it's 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 an alarming statistic, you know, and it needs to get better. And um, you can make a lot of money in trades. You can pivot to a lot of different areas in your career. I started out as an instrument tech. I ended up in VP of sales and marketing. Trevor was uh, in trades. All of our leaders within our organization started out in the trades. They started out on the tools, you know, and we all ended up in different positions. And uh, it's incredible where it can take you. And it's a very fulfilling career. It's interesting. You know, I watched my son, who's now 18, and I usually don't talk about my son on the podcast. But, um, you know, when he went through, uh, well, I told you my sort of my struggles with school when I was younger, and and he's mm -hmm. really struggled the same. And and so he was not a fan of school whatsoever. And um, so when when the opportunity came for him to finally graduate, great job, he couldn't get out of there fast enough. Um, but interesting enough, he is now up in Whitecourt, Alberta, uh, mm -hmm. working working for a contractor up there, and he's welding. Now, he hasn't got his education for welding yet. He hasn't gone to school yet. He did it in grade 12. But he is up there, and he is welding, and he is outdoors, and he's building things. And at the age of 18, he says to me, Dad, I love my job. I love my job. And it, it's, it's really fascinating to watch him. And uh, and yeah, so he's he's one of those kids that have gone, he went straight into the trades and he he knew what he knew what he wanted, what he but, wanted he, but he wanted and he can't get enough of it. Yeah. Let me let me ask you a really honest question. How did you feel when he was as a parent, you know, and he tells you that he wanted to be a welder or he wanted to go into trades? What was your first thought? Well, being the work that I do and understand human instincts. Yeah. I pushed that hard on him, not pushed hard. Yeah. I basically, I gave him the parameters because I know that's who he is. Yeah. I let him be himself. He needed to discover what avenue. So I'll tell you just a real quick story about that. I won't get deep into it, but it's really, mm -hmm. it was really, it's really, once we have time, well, I'll, it's a fascinating story. But here's an interesting thing is he was going to go into mechanics. Um, and so, which is fine. It is trades. But mechanics, typically, when you get it, he was going to uh, get an opportunity through finning. And so mechanics fix, right? That's typically what they do. They fix things. They rebuild mm -hmm. things. They fix. Um, and so that's where he was going to go. And, 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 and fortunately, he failed an exam that didn't allow him to get into that program. Best thing that ever happened. But what he did end up doing is going into welding where he can build things. And there's a, and so when I talk about human instincts and then the work that I do, right, is my son is someone who wants to build, not fix. There's a big difference between the two. And so because I know how he does, that's why with, for me, it was like when he was talking about the trades, I'm like, when he was going into fixing, I'm like, I'm not going to dissuade him from it. I need he needs to figure out his path. But I knew that that was not going to be a long term game. That mm -hmm. would have been a stepping stone when that didn't pan out. And I believe that the universe helped him in that one. Um, then he got the opportunity to build. Now he's actually, now he is, he is doing what he is actually meant to do on this earth, whether it's going to be welding or some kind of, so any, any time that he's going to be building, constructing, fabricating, making things better, quality assurance, he's in his wheelhouse. I love that. And that's great. You're a great dad. And it's amazing that uh, you can recognize those traits in your son. And then you also support and encourage it the way that you did. I think that's wonderful, Warren. And I know where you're going with your question, because it's a really interesting thing. I talked to on another podcast and you got, and you, if you want to, you can listen to it. And it was called, it's two women out of the U S and it was called, she built this city. Um, mm. And they're trying to get women into the trades. Um, okay. Which is, so any of the, any of the listeners, I have to put this out there because we're on this. Uh, any females who grew up being called a tomboy, mm -hmm. they were never a tomboy. They're a woman who actually a female who understood the, the the world in a physical way. And I hope that we can actually uncover that and get more women out in the trades. Absolutely. Uh, just to get a because it's a natural skill set, regardless of gender. Yes, I agree. Yeah. So there, there's my rant of the day. So, <laughs> um, so it's great. I love it that you guys are trying to embrace that. And I know where you're going with it, Trevor. And I think that a lot of the times that when I grew up, and I'll be honest, is that, you know, when the kids who wanted to go in the trades or whatnot, uh, they, they were kind of troublemakers and they went, they were, they were the stupid kids. They were the troubled kids. They were the, 
you know, and they went to the special school and it was like, it's so ridiculous when you think about it, when they yeah. had all this massive talent that would just went unrecognized um, and they were considered, they were considered dumb. And it was like, this just, you know, it just, it makes, it makes no logical sense whatsoever. Yeah. And I mean, for any parents out there that are listening to this, and if your kids are going to trades and if you have any misconceptions about it too, I mean, just, 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 just rethink it. And, and if anybody wants to reach out to me directly, uh, Warren, you know, that's listening to your show, I'd be happy to chat with people that are interested to getting into trades or even parents that are watching their kids going into this area and they have some concerns. I'd love to talk about it. It's a, it's a necessity on this planet. You can make really, really good money. There's lots of job security because there is that big gap there and it can take you to a lot of different areas, you know, later on in your career. So I, um, yeah, thanks. I, 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 I'm really glad that we got to chat, chat about that today. It's super important for us. Absolutely. True. Yeah. Well, thank you for bettering the pond. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. One last, I, I would actually two questions for you. Um, what is one lesson that you've learned along your journey, along your path, um, that you would pass on to an entrepreneur starting a business today? Uh, one journey that I learned on my path. What lesson? Um, one lesson. Huh. Uh, the only person that you have to be better than is the person that you were yesterday. Don't compare yourself to anybody. And it doesn't matter when you start in life as long as you start, right? So if you have an idea, if you have a thought, if you want to try something in life, it's never too late. It's never too early. Just go ahead and do it. And don't compare yourself versus anybody because, I mean, that could lead to some unhappiness. Just concentrate on being the best version of yourself. You cannot find your treasure following somebody else's map. That's, yeah, that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, last question here, Martin. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, Martin Socha, you are standing on top of a mountain. And the whole world is intently listening to you. What would you say? Oh, what would I say? Life as long as you know how to use it. So um, sadly, most people don't, right? They waste the life that they're given, Warren, and only when it's too late, um, they try to compensate for it. So use today, use every day, make yourself satisfied with what you've been given and uh, enjoy the time that you have on this planet because none of us know how much we have. So spend time doing the things that you want to be doing. Spend time with the people that you care about. Be present with your families. Take care of yourself. And uh, try to pursue something that's meaningful in your life. I love it. See, see again, the sage wise goose on the pond. So, <laughs> so, so I really want to, Martin, I really want to thank you for today. I really want to thank, I know this was your very first podcast. You are a podcast rock star um i do want to i want to thank you for for everything that you're doing everything you were doing with, with surepoint um you're really making a difference you're creating ripples out there um i want to you know thank you for for being vulnerable and and sharing your stories uh today that's 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 great for my listeners to learn um now if anybody wants to find you uh where do they go to find you martin just go on LinkedIn. That's uh, we're, I, I'm not on any other social platforms, but LinkedIn super important for 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 me and for us at SharePoint Group. So, uh, LinkedIn Martin uh, Socha is S O C H A, and uh, at SharePoint Group. And then just you can either follow or you can connect with me, and I'd be happy to have you a part of my network. Awesome. And if anybody wants to talk about the kids and getting into the trades and those kind of things too, you 100%. Can yeah. Please, well. please, please reach out. Yeah. Okay. Same thing for my email. I'll give my email on here. Martin.socha, S-O-C-H-A at SurePoint, S-U-R-E-P-O-I-N-T dot C-A. Please send me an email, contact me. I'd be happy to answer any questions and, uh, and just connect with good people on this planet. So cool. Yeah. I'll make sure I get that in the show notes that people can reach out to you when they want to. So all mm -hmm. right. Well, there you have it, folks. We had a great time here today with Martin, and this is Warren Berry, and I'm flocking off to take you beyond the pond to better the pond because we're better together. Thank you so much, Martin. Thanks, Warren.